God bless you and have a great week. met with him and talked with him many times, and uh, I, he right now is ministering in Senegal, which is a very difficult area, and uh, he'll be here tonight, uh, come for the meal, we'll have child care tonight, but I really want the kids to be involved in asking questions of the missionaries, so bring your kids out, because it'll be a, a good interactive time for them. Yeah, so I'm in uh, Matthew chapter 5, still this is the last message in Matthew chapter 5, uh, we're working our way through uh, the... Uh, Sermon on the Mount, and uh, Jesus is saying some very dramatic things, uh, attention getters, and uh, one of the aspects uh, of this Sermon on the Mount is that many of the people in the audience probably have surprised faces because of the things that he's saying, because this wasn't what the religious leaders were telling them. And by the way, if you haven't already done so, you can take out the bulletin, which has an outline and some deeper life questions for you later on, but we'll be reading uh, through Matthew chapter 5, if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, turn to Matthew chapter 5, um, and this is a, I, I don't know if you live this way, but uh, I, in, when I uh, was growing up, and uh, with all the cartoons I, I would see is that, um, is it uh, not moving? Okay. Let me see if it's not connected here. In... So anyway, yep, that's, I got it. All right, good. So um, I don't know, when you watch the cartoons, you always thought uh, dogs and cats were enemies, right? You always thought, this was a very interesting picture to me because uh, with all the cartoons I grew up in, I thought they, were, they hated each other. I actually went to a house where the, there was a cat and a dog, and I go, how, how do you have them in the same house? But I guess that happens, right? How many have a cat and a dog in the same house? Or, or, see that? That does happen. Well... So we're looking at loving your enemies today, Matthew uh, chapter 5, verses uh, 43 to the end of the chapter. Uh, Follow along as I read um, uh, 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for these words of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, and pray, Lord, that we might apply them to our lives as we are looking to be kingdom saints. Here at Parkside, we we want to know the king and serve his kingdom. And so, Father God, help us to be the men and women that you called us to be. We just pray your blessing upon this message in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. In chapter 5, uh, earlier, we talked about uh, hate. Now we're looking at Matthew uh, 5, 43, the end of the chapter. We talked about um, being mad at somebody. Do you remember that? Uh, being mad? You know, like, you know, getting your dander up. Did you ever get your dander up? By the way, what is dander anyway? I really tried. I was looking at that, you know, don't get your dander up. Uh, well, in the 16th or 18th century, uh, it was called hackles between the 16th and 18th century. Hackles, the tiny flakes of dry skin that shed when the hair on the back of an animal's neck stood up when they were angry, as in cats and dogs. And some people are allergic to dander. Uh, it's a, akin to the word dandruff. It's smaller, but it can make people sick. And uh, anybody allergic to dander? That's another question. I mean, we actually, we had some people in our, our church that were allergic to dander, so that was our excuse for not having dogs and cats, right? Wasn't that one of our excuses? I had many other excuses, but that was one of our excuses, that we, would, we entertain people all the time, and to have somebody over that's allergic uh, to dander is very, very bad for them. Uh, but, you know, what, what makes you upset? What gets you angry? 
I mean, I said a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about angry, uh, being a, a, angry at people and saying raka to somebody, I, I talked about my mother who used to say, I'm so angry I could spit, right? I, and I didn't know that you had to be angry in order to be able to spit. That was one of the things. And I just heard this recently. I'm so angry I could cry. Aren't they mixing emotions there? Or is, I'm like, wait a second. You got two different emotions going on there. Uh, you know, I, I was angry enough that I could punch a hole in the wall. I mean, guys, how many of you have done that? All right, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. You don't have to raise confess. No confess. I mean, yeah. Uh, I, I heard this week also, <laughs> I'm so angry I could rip somebody's face off. And they were, a, 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 they were plastic surgeons, so I think they could do that. I, <laughs> uh, I mean, what... What do you despise? I think sometimes when you despise something so much, that really gets you mad. So, I mean, i got to tell you, I, I'm, a, I'm very upset, you know, with people who uh, trashed playgrounds. You know, I go to a playground, and there's a can over here, a bottle over there, or a wrapper over there, and I was, what, I, what I do is I start picking it up, and that just gets me more and more angry, uh, especially when, Janet knows this, when trash flies out of the back of a pickup truck... <sighs> did they really believe their trash was going to stand in the back? It happens a lot more in North Country than it did in Poughkeepsie, right? We didn't have that many pickups in Poughkeepsie. I was, um, you know, that's another thing. When I'm on a motorcycle, I'm riding on a motorcycle. Last, I haven't done that in 10 years. I gave up my motorcycle when I moved here. But uh, a person flicking their cigarette out the window, hitting me right in the mask. You know, I could get in an accident when that happens. So I get re- that gets my dander up. Now, when you hear about the word despise or hate, some kids may think of broccoli, liver, or Brussels sprouts. And uh, matter of fact, I think some adults think that, what they despise and what they hate. Uh, Again, we're not talking about getting angry at someone. We're talking about despising someone. Big difference. You know, I get angry. You probably get angry with your spouse, or you get angry with your children. That's different than despising them. And this is what we're talking about when we, we talk about enemies. As a matter of fact, uh, again, as you, as you think about enemies, uh, who do you despise? What group of people really gets you upset? Uh, when I think of God and how he loves me, and I was a, an enemy of God. That's what the Bible says. In my sin, I was an enemy of God. But he loved me, even while I was yet a sinner. Christ died for me. That's a powerful statement. So I'm going to ask you this question, um, it, it, and this is a very important. Is it possible to hate the sin and love the sinner? That's what God did with me. He hated my sin. I was an enemy of God. He despised my sin. But he loved me. I was worth, I was someone worth dying for in Jesus' eyes. Even though I was a sinner. Is it possible to separate the sin of a person with the person, to hate the sin and love the sinner. I think we do it with our children. I, th- I think we do it with, you know, our, our spouse. <laughs> you know, we don't like exactly what they're doing, but we love them. But when it's a, a people group on the other side of the world that's doing destruction to another people group, it's easy to despise them and hate them and to put their sin together with the sinner and not love them at all. Correct? Isn't it easier? And so I I believe, even though that God does it, He wants us to love. He wants us to love with His perfect love all the people in the world. That's That's what this verse is about. To love like He loves. To love our enemies. 
Love for your enemies is just a, not a concept that we were taught in school. It was not a concept that we were taught in our families. And it was, it's not a concept that we even are taught in the military. I mean, you military guys, were you taught to love your enemies? This is, this is a concept that is beyond this world. It is beyond the rules of this world. Um, matter of fact, uh, in the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees, they actually added, oh, the, you know the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. And that was, by the way, in the Old Testament. Remember, Jesus is not bringing any new rules here. That was in the Old Testament. But they added, but you can hate your enemies. That was the caveat. You can love your neighbor as yourself, but you can also hate your enemies. The Bible, listen carefully, God never says you can hate your enemies. He says there are enemies. He says there's going to be destruction that happened in Nineveh. There's going to be destruction that happened to the uh, Egyptians. There's going to be destruction, and I will pour out my wrath on these people. He never says that it's okay for you to hate your enemies. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, you can hate your enemies. That was a pharisaical saying, love your neighbor, but hate your enemies. You have heard it said, Jesus says, you can love your neighbor, but hate your enemies, but I tell you, I want you to love your enemies. Jesus was directly contradicting the religious leaders of the day. And I am sure that the crowd was doing Oh, oh, he's going to be in trouble for doing that. You ever try to correct the teacher in the classroom? Oh, by the way, teacher, you're absolutely wrong about what you just said. Okay, I'll see you after class. Let's look at some scriptures. I think we looked at some of these. Uh, Leviticus, it's the Old Testament. It says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as you yourself, I'm Lord. Okay, so I could deal with that. That's my people. That's my group. That's my tribe. Love my tribe. Love others. Wait a second. Same chapter, verses 32 to 34. Rise in the presence of agent, show respect for the elderly, and revere your God. I'm Lord. And when an alien from another country lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native-born. Love him as yourself, for you are aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. Someone from outside your tribe, someone who may come from a country that's an enemy country, comes and visits you or comes to your tribe, you are to love them and treat them as family. Yeah, but I don't like them. They curse. They smoke cigarettes. They drink heavily. They have loud parties. I don't like them. I'm not going to get into it, but I, I've also said you may not like them, but you have to love them. And that's that's something that we are called to do. Love. Even the aliens. You know, our international workers do that, by the way. Think of what is being said in this verse of Scripture. Someone who doesn't know the language, someone, uh, you know, who, who is different from a different race, a sojourner with a different lifestyle, comes in your midst, or with our international workers, we go in their midst, and we love on them even though they hate Jesus and they hate Christians. They are literally enemies of the gospel and we are called to go to the hard places to reach them. By the way, that's, that's why I love talking with Keith Ellenberger. He is so happy to be in countries where they hate Christians. Would you be happy in a country that hate Christians? Let me give you some insight that I think I have, a little bit. I've been living long enough to see this happening. As a matter of fact, it happened 
67 years ago, too, when I was born. This country, America, is starting to hate Christians, evangelical Christians. If you don't know that, wake up. So we say, oh, that country over there hates Christians. I love our country because we're a Christian nation. We have some Christian principles still here. Uh, we have long been a non-Christian nation. So, wake up. That being said, we are to love people no matter who they are or where they come from. And our international workers just do that. They love their neighbor. And so it begs the question right off the bat, who is our neighbor? Jesus did answer this in another place. You know the, the parable about the Good Samaritan, which is the, the local hospital here, is named after the parable of the Good Samaritan. And remember, uh, there was this man that was beat up and robbed, and he was laying on the side of the road, and a, a priest came by and saw the guy on the side of the road, and he went around him, make sure he wasn't in his path. And a, then a, a worship leader came by and saw the man in the road and went around him. But then there was this Samaritan, the hated Samaritans. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They were the enemy. And the Samaritans saw the man in the road. He was on his path, picked him up, treated his uh, uh, wounds, brought him, put him on his donkey, brought him to a, um, a, an inn, gave the innkeeper money to take care of him until he was well. And he, the, even the Samaritan said, I will come back and anything you paid for to help this man, I will reimburse you. And Jesus says, that's what a good neighbor is. That's a person who loves their neighbor as himself. A person that's on your path. Someone that's in your, way, in your way, as you're going your way, you see their need and you meet their need. That's what a neighbor is. Someone that was on his path. Instead of going around, instead of ignoring, we do something about it. You know, this, this corollary, well, love your neighbor, but hate your enemies, which is not in the Bible, is what we actually think. You know, um, that's the definition of an enemy, right? Isn't that a definition that you avoid them, that you hate them? I mean, by the way, think of all the enemies you have, right? I hope there's not a long list. <laughs> but it's a person you don't like. You hate them. You don't want to run into them. You don't want to do anything for them. They're your enemy. That's kind of like the definition of an enemy. But he is saying, neighbor is anybody in your path. The, love, the word love here is the word agape love, which is an uh, active, sacrificial love. It's not a passive love. And again, it's not just action alone. It has a lot to do with emotion. It's not something that you do out of guilt or out of obligation or legalism. And it's not just an emotion, a passive type of uh, indifference. You know, how many of us ever said, well, yeah, that person's really in bad shape. Someone should do something for them. Have you ever said that? Man, I, I, you know, I heard about that tragedy. You know, someone should should do something for them. Who's that someone? You know? Who are you thinking of? The agape, motivated Christian will say, I need to do something for them. I need to do it. Not someone. I need to do something. You know, again, it's, uh, it, we're being called on to be like Jesus. And I think what he is saying here is we need to show what we're made of. We need to show the world that we are his children, that we are of the Father. We are not of this world. We need to love like Jesus loved. We need to love like God the Father loved. Love our neighbor and love our enemy. And I love this whole thing. What is this about? Remember the sun and the rain. Jesus said, remember the sun and the rain. 
Well, I remember the sun and the rain. We had sun a couple days ago. We have rain today. Okay, is that what he means? Where does the rain fall? On the just and the unjust. They, they, they have crops like we do. And even our enemy needs and depends upon the sun and the rain. As we need the sun and the rain. And believe it or not, God's sun and God rain blesses our enemies. And are you mad at God for doing that, by the way? I'm mad at God. For, he's not supposed to bless our enemies. But the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Because God loves the world that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die. So they have eternal life in him if they believe. He sends the rain and the sun on both the just and the unjust. So remember that. Whenever it rains and sun, that the rain falls, um, it's something about August showers that bring September floods, though. You know, again, um, rain was an important blessing in Jesus' day, and it's an important blessing on us. Then this next passage, and, and he says, that, and, and then he says, you know, if you love those who love you, what reward is that? Not even, uh, not, not, are not the, even the tax collectors doing that? Even the evil people of our world, tax collectors, by the way, I hope there's no tax collectors here. Back then they were very corrupt, um, and they worked for the Roman Empire, and they were Jewish, but they worked for the Roman Empire, and their commission was whatever they wanted to collect. So they, they, they set their commissions at 25% and collected taxes and just robbed their own people of money. So they were really bad people. Okay, so, and if you only greet your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans greet people that they know? You know, Jesus is saying, so if you only entertain people that you know and family members and friends, aren't you just like a pagan? How are you Christian in just entertaining friends and family. Or just greeting friend, friends and family. So let's talk about this. Uh, this is, you know, we, not only it says love, but greet strangers. Greet strangers? <laughs> you know, again, um, don't, d didn't your mom tell you not to talk to strangers? Don't talk to strangers. Is that what your mom said? How many, how many moms out there have told your kids that they could talk to any stranger Anywhere, anytime. <laughs> My mom was like that one. She would, she would hit, hug and kiss anybody. And, and, and like I would come to the door. And uh, uh, our paper root guy would come to the door collecting. And my mom would not know that he was not my friend. But he'd be at the door. We'd both be coming at the same time. He was collecting. And she'd come up and say, oh, you're a friend of Mike. Start hugging and kissing him. i go, no, no. This guy is just collecting for the newspaper. She says, oh, but he needs a hug and a kiss on you. Do you teach your kids to greet strangers? I hope you do. What I'm, I think he's trying to say is that I'm not about to, by the way, to challenge mom's sayings. because You know, moms have a lot of different sayings. Uh, I remember my mom. She used to say things that, that are really weird. My mom would say, drop that stick or you'll poke both of your eyes out. We never could figure that how one stick could poke, but if you poked one eye out, are you going to do it again to the other eye? Um, if, you, if you keep up that silly face, your eyes will stay that way. Okay. And this one, make sure you eat everything on your plate. It'll make you strong and healthy. No, not always. Um, and this is my favorite one. If you break your legs falling from that tree, don't come running to me. Mom's sayings, right? Mom's sayings. And don't talk to strangers. What, what Jesus is trying to say here is, um, I'm sorry, the next one. We are agents of God's grace. And we should talk to strangers when it's right. And look at the word, and when it's wise. Teach your children to be wise. 
If a police officer in uniform comes and asks them a question, their response is, Mom told me not to talk to strangers. Tell your children to be wise. Don't talk to strangers unless it's your teacher who's being introduced to you or a police officer who needs information to help your family. Teach your children to be wise. And, and people will say, you know, my kids, you know, I, I just, you know, I'm under five years old, just teach them, don't talk to strangers. But after that, start to teach them. This is what God wants. When it is right and when it is wise, talk to strangers. And by the way, adults, talk to strangers. I, I'm, I'm serious. I, I, again, I, I think we've got it ingrained in our minds that somehow if we talk to strangers, they're, they're going to shoot us with a gun. I, it doesn't always happen that way. Okay? Life is too short to keep making excuses for not going over to someone who is crying and asking, can I pray for you? If you see someone in the mall, they're sitting alone, and they're crying, you see someone... Uh, it, even in line at Walmart, or someone right in Walmart looking at their grocery list and counting how many groceries they have because they don't have enough money. Go up and say, I, I see that you're struggling. Uh, are, can I pray for you? That's an opportunity for us to be an agent of God's grace and love. And that's why we're on the planet. Talk to strangers with wisdom when it's appropriate, when God's Spirit is prompting. So does loving enemies and talking to strangers make us children of our Father in heaven? No. <laughs> Some of you are going to go out of here and say, Pastor Mike told me I've got to do this. I don't want to do it. I hate doing this. But I'll talk to a stranger. I feel guilty from this sermon. And that's what I'll do. It. I'll do it out of obligation. Don't do it. <laughs> you know, that's like... That's like uh, you know, a, a teacher being talked into calcium to te teach a, a, a class that they don't want to teach. They hate the kids that are in that class. They never wanted to teach this level, but they're told that they have to teach it. Well, I'll go teach that class just this one year, but I hate doing it. You know, that's going to be a great teacher. What do you think? <laughs> get, get those people to teach. No, if it's not a change of heart, if, this is the whole point. The whole point of the Sermon of the Mount is not the doing of the things. It's being and having that attitude in your heart that there are lost people around us that need Jesus and we are to be the agents of love and grace for even our enemies. Especially tax collectors, by the way. So, you know, but again, how are, you can always ask this question. How are we different than tax collectors? How are we different than the pagans that we criticize? You know, how are we being more like Christ? Uh, and I, I hope that uh, that's the thing. Um, again, the last thing that Jesus says here, and I, I, after he compares us with pagans, and by the way, he, he's comparing us with pagans and tax collectors and sinners. You know, how are you any better than them pagans, right? He says, he said, the verse 48, and this, uh, I love this. So his answer is, be perfect. That's what I want you to do. I want you to be perfect. He says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we all say, I got that. I'm, I'm there, man. I can be perfect, right? That's what we say, right? <laughs> I even talk to people that are not Christians, and I say, you know, God says we've got to be perfect. And what do they say to me right off the bat? Nobody's perfect, right? I think I said that to a couple of people this weekend. Nobody's perfect. Usually when people are talking to me, and I go, well, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Well, nobody is perfect. That's exactly right. So this, what, is, what is Jesus trying to do? Just make us feel silly? I mean, I think we're confused with the word because we think it's, perfect, and we think Jesus is saying be sinless. Again, the word is a very interesting word. It's tilios uh, in the Greek. Uh, it means to be complete or without blemish. It means to be complete in Jesus. 
Our holiness comes not from what we do, but who we are in Christ. Get it again. It's not what we do. That doesn't make us holy. Who makes us holy? Jesus makes us holy. We are complete in Christ. And with that, and the fact that because he's forgiven us our sins, we can go out on the ledge, and we can, and we can go out on, and go into our <laughs> uncomfortable zones and do things like loving our neighbor and talking to strangers because we're complete in Christ. We have been perfected in Christ because we are holy in him, and we have the power of the Holy Spirit, and we can do this. He would not tell us to do it if we couldn't do it. To be perfect in Christ. Feel that confidence that he gives us in the power of the Holy Spirit. That we are complete in Jesus. I believe as we're washed spiritually clean and holy like he is holy, we are complete. It's to possess the Father's character to love perfectly the person uh, no matter what the sin. Uh, this love of God was proven throughout the Bible. A uh, good example is Hosea. By the way, if you're reading through the Bible, Hosea is coming up. And you read through the book of Hosea, he was told to marry an unfaithful prostitute as a testimony of God's love to a wicked and perverse nation. And so that's exactly what God does. He loves people that are wicked and perverse, like Mike Gerhardt. And he loved me so much, he sent his son Jesus to die for me. So can the, bar, can the bar be any higher? And the answer is no, but this is our goal. This is who we are in Christ, to love like Jesus loved, to love like God loved, to be complete in him. Uh, one practical way I've learned to love the unlovable is to pray for anybody who's against me. Uh, and by the way, as a pastor, you think, oh, he doesn't have anybody against him. No, there are people that will tell me I'm a terrible person, I'm wasting my life, uh, and there are people like that. So I pray for them. As a matter of fact, if you would pray, the more prayer, the more love. If you start to pray for somebody and pray for them every single night, and pray for their, and by the way, don't pray that they die or crash or, or uh, you know, that their house burns down. That's not, that's not the prayer I'm talking about. The prayer of love, so they make Jesus and they they find Jesus. And they, the more prayer, the more love, the more love, the more prayer. And you know that. That's a principle of Scripture. When you pray for over a year for someone, they will no longer be your enemy. Alfred Plummer said this, to return evil for evil is de uh, bleh, to return evil for good is devilish, to return good for good is human, to return good for evil is divine. We pursue our, our new nature in Jesus Christ with a hope to be like Jesus. Uh, whenever I see my sons act like me, it scares me. I realize they have patterned themselves after me. The good and the bad and the not so good uh, characteristics. Someone always goes as far to say that they get all their good traits from their mother and they get all the bad traits from me. I think that's an accurate description. But that being said, you have a holy father. You have a holy brother, Jesus. You have a Holy Spirit in you. Are you exhibiting the traits of your father in heaven? Are you like your father? And how are you like your father? Do you remember what Jesus said when he spoke from the cross? What did he say? He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. The very people that put him on the cross, that crucified him, he looks down at them with great love and forgiveness and asks the Father, forgive us for them. I have tried the practice of doing that. When someone really gets me mad or angry, I talked about somebody cutting me off on the highway or something, like that. I start to pray for them. I, I just, and I, I sometimes even say, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And they should get a driving lesson. But more than that, I'm, 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 I'm more aware 
that there might be a situation that they're driving fast. There might be a situation that I don't know about, but God knows about, and I want that person to be covered by my prayers. I may be the only person in the entire world that is praying for that driver. Think about that. Your boss may be the worst boss in the world, or your commanding officer might be the worst commanding officer. How many people are praying for him? You may be the only person praying for that person. And that's what God needs. He needs prayer warriors who are willing to say, Father, forgive them. They need you, Jesus. Jesus, save them. Holy Spirit, come upon them. And they need us to be loving them. We must uh, show the wealth. We must show the wealth of love to the impoverished people around us because love comes from God because God is love, First John. Um, I like this because it comes from First John also, that perfect love casts out all fear, so remember to be perfect because perfect love will keep you from the fear of talking to strangers. It'll keep you from the fear of loving your neighbor and, and it'll keep you from the fear of helping somebody. Picking them up on the side of the road. I know that's not popular, and I don't recommend everyone doing it. But be careful about the fear that keeps you from being loving and live in love without fear. Let's uh, stand and close in a word of prayer. Father God, I just thank you so much for these... Uh, these cryptic sayings of Jesus, and I, they're very powerful. I pray that we would just apply the principles as best as the Holy Spirit can do in our lives, that we would yield to that Holy Spirit to transform us to be more like Jesus. I pray for anyone here who is um, very distracted by hating an enemy, whether it's a person who lives next door to them or a person at their work or a nation or a group of people that um, they've read about that did. I, I just pray that we would begin to be more like Jesus and looking at people and asking the Father of heaven, the Father of grace and love to forgive them. But they don't know what they did. Bless each one as we uh, sing this song. And Lord, if there's any commitments that need to be made, may, they, may we come forward and kneel and, and pray and, and deal with those commitments today. As we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said,